So this is where we left off last time. Uh, we started with this formula. This is a slight variant on what we did before. So here in this particular paper, which is by two guys, Nagarajan and Rukenstein. Uh, Ali Rukenstein is at SUNY Buffalo. He's 95 years old. This is one of the guys who came right after Jacob Kalashvili, and he thought about surfactant micellization. Uh, this now is the fraction of G merged. So earlier on, what I was doing was I had another term, which was G times X1 times all that stuff, and that was the number of chains in G merged. This is the number fraction of G merged. So it's slightly different, but it's the same quantity that's being calculated. This is the monomer fraction, X1. Delta mu G is that standard Gibbs energy of transfer. And G, in this case, I was using N, he uses G. But just to be true, I'm going to use that language. And they decided in this first paper in 1980-something to test it on three classes of molecules. Okay? And this particular one is actually very useful because they were able to change N there. They were able to get a sequence of longer and longer surfactants and actually test the theories quantitatively. Okay. So you need things like the volume of each of these groups. That's something they could measure or get from group contribution methods. So a lot of the molecular parameters that describe these things are known. Like the Van der Waals volumes are known, uh, cohesive energy densities, things like that. So they went through and they said, these are all the possible contributions to the chemical potential. So this is starting to get much more refined, and I want to walk you through this refined analysis. In reality, the principles are all set, but I... I should tell you what it takes to start to get quantitative information. Uh, so there are six terms here, and I'm going to walk you through all of those. But it turns out, in the end, these three are the only ones that matter. This delta mu zero def is what I spent all of yesterday talking about. This is the entropy deformation of that tail of the surfactant. Okay? And so that's really the new piece of physics that got put in because of all the work that people did with polymers. So if you go back and look at Israel Ashvili and then come to this new class of papers, that's the new physics that's good. All right? So then let's go through these other terms. This is the transfer free energy. And if you go talk to people who do protein folding and stuff like that, they do alkane water transfer free energies, right? So you take an alkane from an alkane phase, and then you move it into water. And why you do that is if you take a hydrocarbon, which is in water, when you make a surfactant micelle, hydrocarbons go away from water and go into a purely hydrocarbon phase, right? So that's the energetic gain that you get. And you can actually measure that. That's not tabulated for an extremely large variety of compounds. So you start with hydrocarbons. People have done it for alcohol, so on and so forth. They've done it for all the known amino acids, because that is also what is involved with the folding of proteins. So you can go to a database now and get that number. And it turns out it's only temperature dependent. It's known. It's quantified. This term, I've already told you what that is. And that last term is actually a very interesting term. This is an interfacial tension term. Right? So what they say is you take a surfactant, you make a micelle, right? and the picture I sold you was that the head groups would be sitting on the outside, exposed to water. The tail would be completely hidden from the water phase. Right? Now imagine if the coverage is not so good. Suppose you start swelling the micelle. Okay? But imagine the micelle just fluctuates. And it can fluctuate very easily because all it has to overcome is the conformational entropy of the polymer chain. When it does that, the micelle opens up a little bit, and you create interaction between the water and the hydrocarbon, which is very unfavorable. Okay? So this term here really is starting to count for that interfacial tension between the micelle and the water, and you really want to account for changes in surface area. Then there's lots of other terms, like they started accounting for the effect of added salt, any dipole moments here. So for example, this chain has a dipole, and they wanted to get dipole moments. It turns out they accounted for everything they could think of. These last few terms really don't matter. So I'm not going to bother. So full disclosure, this is what it all looks like. All right? This is the transfer free energy. As I told you, it's temperature dependent. This is that interfacial tension term. They calculated the aggregate surface tension change in area. So this is the natural area that you want for a head group. Any changes from that because of the swelling of the micelle gives rise to the second term. And this is the last term that we worked out, this R squared over NL squared term, which is the entropy of the surfactant tail. That's really the only contribution. These three factors that you see are for spheres, cylinders, and lamellae. These are geometrical factors that they worked out. Yes, sir. So here's the final proof, right? 
And so this actually just, I wanted to close the loop to tell you this actually works. So these are the two guys that I told you about. These are those three classes of compounds. The surfactant tail length is being changed. And you can see here the range goes from 8 to 16, which I told you is sort of the sweet spot. If you make it too long, it will become a solid, and this conformational entropy of the tail no longer matters. If you make it too short, and it doesn't matter either, because then it becomes rigid. So they think the persistence length, or the length over which the chain behaves like a rod, is about six carbons. Okay? And so the idea that it's larger than six tells you it's really a, a, really a baby polymer chain. Okay? And so when this, you get this good agreement for the critical micelle concentration, and they used a polymer theory for the surfactant tail, you've got to wonder. There's got to be some cancellation of headers going on. Okay? So I am not so satisfied that this is really great, but it tells you you've got most of the essential physics right. So that's what it tells you. As you make the chains longer, the critical micelle concentration goes down. That tells you the chain wants less and less to be dissolved in water. It wants to form micelles very easily. And this actually is very interesting. It says, what happens if I change this effect in tail? What happens to the aggregation number? The points of the experimental data, that dark line is the prediction. There's going on here, OK? And it captures this general trend that as the surfactant tail gets longer, you make bigger micelles. And that sort of makes sense. OK? Any questions? Oh, these, these different lines here? So I had these three different compounds, right? So I had these three different things. OK? And for each of the, I didn't bother to distinguish between them, because it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, they went through some detail, got all kinds of parameters, and then just draw a line through it. Yeah? The dashed line was the, there was another theory that Israel Ashwili had come up with, where he didn't account for the surfactant tail properly. So this is them just baiting on their opposition. That's why it's a dashed line. It's not the full line. Theirs is the full line. No, no, that theory is not okay, because that theory does not have the surfactant distortion at all. Right? So it, that should predict. See, the problem with that is these ones, they start out by making spheres, and then it goes to cylinders and lamellae. Right? For spheres, you would predict nothing with the old Israel Ashwili theory. So Israel Ashwili came and patched up his theory. It doesn't matter. I mean, these are like, you know, people trying to outdo each other as they make better and better theories. To me, this is sort of the state-of-the-art theory. That does a good job. It has all the essential physics. And beyond that, I don't want to worry about it anymore. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. Somebody asked me about shape fluctuations of these micelles. Okay? How would I start, given this theory, how would I start to think about shape fluctuations? Any ideas? So shape fluctuations means you start with a micelle like this. You can imagine it distorting like that. That's one possibility. The other one is the surface itself distorts, right? How would you start to quantify things like that? I have truly lost them on Wednesday morning. OK, I'm feeling better because I've walked, talked now for 10 minutes, right? You guys haven't talked, so let's get you talking. Should I start volunteering people? He's smiling. He knows he's the first target. <laughs> Let me sit down. Anybody have ideas? So if I, let's think about this problem. You want to do that, right? The whole shape, the radius increases, right? What terms do you think are going to change? I didn't hear you. Somebody said something. That's OK. They can speak. That's OK. <laughs> Good, that's one. Anything else you can think of? Dipole. Very good. Anything else? Alas, all my effort for the last two days have gone to waste. Nothing is. <laughs> What's the most important thing? You start, imagine you make the micelles smaller. What happens to R? Decreases, right? What happens to the entropy of the chains? It's squeezing the chains, right? R squared over NL squared becomes smaller. So there will be a push outward. So those kind of fluctuations will be disfavored. So you'll see a balance again. This term, the deformation term, 
will not want you to get smaller. It will want you to go back to its natural size, whereas the balance will be against that guy. So you would want to take D mu G dr, for example, as a way of characterizing free energy cost of fluctuations. And then if you want to get a distribution of the size, you just do dx g dr for each one, and then see what happens as a function of for each entity, how does the size affect itself. From there, you can start to calculate fluctuations. And there's this guy, Egal Schleifer, who's at Northwestern, who spent hours and hours doing these kind of calculations. So needless to say, people have understood how to do size fluctuations and also then elastic fluctuations off the surface layer itself. Okay. So then once you understood, so factons doing die blocks is really straightforward, right? Die blocks are where just you don't have a small head group, you have a long head group and a long tail group, so the only modification to this theory is that both of these branches have confirmation of fluctuations. So you can start with the old theory, you can just add fluctuations for both one, confirmation of fluctuations for each one of those, or the cost of squeezing each one of those things. Put that term in, and then you can start to predict what these guys will do, okay? And it turns out that, I don't know if I have this next, well, let's go back. So these are probably the most tested systems in the world. Okay. So these are the morphologies that are formed. This is a classical diablock copolymer. One block is styrene, the other block is isoprene. What is plotted at the bottom is the composition of isoprene or styrene, if you like, uh, and the different morphologies that you get. This is what is seen experimentally. There's 30 years of experiments that have established this. And this is the morphology plot that has been established by many, many, many people, now almost in quantitative detail, excruciating detail. Chi here is the energetic dislike between the two blocks, the siren and the isoprene, n is the chain length, this is the composition. In the middle you have lamellae, then you have hexagons, BCC, and disorder. And you asked me a question yesterday about simulating spheres. If you look at the shape of that phase diagram, you see the BCC spheres occupy a very small part of the phase diagram, which is why it's very hard to get those back. Okay, from a simulation point of view, it's very hard to get that. So who cares about any of this stuff? I'm going to tell you the relevance of all these ideas. I mean, I've done theory, I've told you how to do the math. This is why many people in application care. This is why people are funding this kind of work. I'm going to give you two or three examples. This is about 10 years old. This is, about, this is a science paper. So what they did, so go back and think about where do you use media where you need small magnetic dots, very high density, very ordered, addressable dots. You understand my question? Think of an application where that might be useful. Yes. Did I hear information? What does that mean? Hard drives, excellent. So the idea is that people want to make this kind of an array, okay? Right now, you know how people make dots? Any idea how people make dots? How magnetic disks are made? You know what lithography looks like? Anybody heard of the term lithography? No? You've heard that. Do you know what lithography means? Oh, this is going to turn into a fun engineering lecture. I love it. Good. I love it. What, Shrikan? You making such nice remarks? <laughs> what does lithography mean? It comes from two Greek words, right? Graphia means to write. Litho comes from the word for light. So it's writing with light. So what you do is you start with a pattern, and then you use diffraction of light to expose a polymer to either light or dark. Where the polymer sees light, bonds break, and then you can etch it away, and where you don't, the polymer stays, and then you can start templating that by growing copper or silicon or something like that, okay? You understand the strategy of doing that. So you start with a polymer film, typically it's polymethyl methacrylate, and people at IBM have worked over the years to make these polymers better and better. You put a pattern on top, it's called a photo mask. You shine light through, wherever the light shines, the PMMA degrades. You put in some that, something that comes in and dissolves away the small PMMA. You're left with a Swiss cheese-like morphology. You backfill with silicon or whatever. And that gives you the things you want, the dots. Okay? What is the problem with that? Sounds great, right? 
It's a very good technology. Why do I want to do better? What is the limitation? Any ideas? Yes? Sizes, say more. I hear whispers. Who whispered sizes? Oh. Thank you. It's limited by the diffraction limit, and so people believe you can work as hard as you want. If you use light, you can get down to feature sizes of lambda over 10. So if you're dealing with yellow light, that's 4,500 angstroms. That means you can make 45 nanometer feature sizes. Do you know how big the latest generation of computers, the chips they make, you know the line width? The circuits. Anybody know the line widths for circuits? That's right, 15 nanometers. So the only way you can do that is go out into shorter and shorter wavelengths and start doing things with x-rays. And you know that's not really helpful to human beings, right? So people have to come up with a new way of doing it. That's not based on light. So the idea that they came up with was to use blockopolymers. So now you have two blocks. It's a surfactant. If you pick them just right, they will make cylinders, for example. Okay? So that's the idea here. You start out, you put down a big pattern, lithographically, which should be a 15 nanometer spacing. That's what's done here. Onto that, you coat a layer of the diblockopolymer. Okay? The tablock polymer wants to make cylinders, but the cylinder pattern width I can pick to whatever I want by picking the two block lengths. If I make one this size, one that big, that would set the cylinder size to be this, or that, or that. You guys following? So the thing is that you use the underlying mask to sort of template off of. So one cylinder will go and sit on top of the cylinder, but then everything else will follow along. As long as you have an even number of cylinders put in here and there, the next one would fall on top. And so you would get a much smaller spacing of cylinders just by using this larger template. You guys following the logic? Did I confuse the crap out of you? So imagine that the distance between two cylinders is five times the normal cylinder width that you want, okay? By having a die block copolymer that has a smaller cylinder width, as long as I'm commensurate, that an integer number of cylinders falls between two cylinders in the pattern, things will completely template, okay? And then you can do the itching, etching, and then go back and put back, for example, silicon into it. So you have a tie block, you would start with something like that. You have a styrene block, you have an isoprene block. One of them is very radiation sensitive, you can etch it out. Backfill with silicon, and that's how you get this. These are cylindrical patterns, and just by looking at it, you can tell these are like 15, 20 nanometers. The state of the art right now is six nanometer dots. And they claim that is four terabytes per square millimeter is the storage you can get. I mean, these are some unbelievable technological breakthroughs that are happening just using the idea of surfactant assembly, understanding how to control that. Okay, and right down here, they've made stripes. This is by using lamellae. So if you have a lamellar space, then you can etch away the one in the middle, backfill with whatever you want, and off you go. You can make lamellae, you can make standing cylinders, you can do whatever you want. And this is now the state of the art as to how the best hard drives are being made. And that uses the idea of surfactant self assembly. Cool? Here's something that's very important again. I'm going to ask you none of you guys understand application, I think. So let me sort of teach you. You go into your. Uh, how many of you have seen a gas refinery, an oil refinery? One person, two people. What happens in an oil refinery? You start with something that comes out of the ground. It's got this huge spectrum of stuff, chain lengths, right? And the older the refinery is, the more tarry it is, the longer the chain lengths are. You want to make C8, right? Remember, your fuel is octane for gasoline, right? So you have to crack the silly thing. And cracking is done normally thermally, but what they figured out more and more is by catalyzing it, you can get better efficiency, and you can do it at lower temperatures. The kind of catalysts, the best ones, are high surface area, silicon, aluminum-based catalyst. Okay? So you want to maximize area. Minimize volume, because volume is cost. Higher area means the reactions go faster. Right? How would you do that? People realize, and this is a technology by mobile from the 1980s. This is called ZSM5 is the name of the catalyst. 
what they did, they started with a surfactant that wanted to form cylinders. Those cylinders packed in this hexagonal phase. Okay, so they let the, the surfactant do that. It assembled, they make a monolithic sample, which is millimeters across of the surfactant that formed hexagonally ordered cylinders. They put a compound called silicon tetrachloride into this. And under the right conditions, the silicon tetrachloride will polymerize to form an SIOSI -SI network. Okay? So that's this idea of forming the SIOSI -SI network. Then you dissolve away the surfactant, and you're left with a mirror image, which is where the surfactant wort you opened up. And inside, you have the catalyst completely available. You can control how big that is based on the surfactant that you picked. So you can get 10 nanometer size, okay? 20 nanometer size holes. Okay, and that's how currently people have the best available catalysts that are used for all sorts of reactions. All right? So that's what people have done, and people like Galen Stuckey have made. So this is a paper from, I think, ChemMat or something like that. The number of metals that could be templated by using these techniques and the compounds that you have to do it, and how you would do the procedure. I mean, you don't care about the details. It's telling you you're making features in sort of the 10 nanometer length. Just by taking a surfactant, using another compound, using the surfactant assembled structure as a template. Everybody happy? This is what I do for a living. And I thought I'd sort of walk you through this thing. Um, I'm going to get done early because I just don't, I'm sort of out of energy. Look at a car, okay? Look at the Airbus, the new one, or the Boeing 787, right? What makes them more efficient? Anybody know? So think about the Airbus 78, I mean, the Boeing 787, the Airbus A350. Why are people so excited about it? How many of you have flown those planes? Dreamliner, the 787 is called the Dreamliner. The A50 does not have a name yet. Why is the Dreamliner so popular? Why do airliners love it so much? Nobody has a clue. Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> <laughs> Sri, why are you laughing? <laughs> okay, any other fake news coming through? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Are you having a serious answer? Light, he says. You guys agree with that? Why is it lighter? So they said that the Boeing 787 is about 10 to 20 percent less energy consuming than the other planes in the business, right? And that's because it's lighter. Why is it lighter? You guys don't keep up with technology, do you? Nobody knows? Made of polymer. So the old planes, right? Think about how many of you go look really, next time you're on a plane, you check the side, everything is plastic. But look at the outside skin of the plane. It's always aluminum, right? And they like aluminum because it apparently does very well under cyclical loading, breeds like that. So when you go to high, high altitudes, the inside is ten, always kept to a pressure of 5,000 to 7,000 feet, atmospheric pressure. Outside, you're at 45,000 feet or 40,000 feet. The thing swells up like a balloon. It does that many, many times. And lots of times early on in the aviation business, you had failures because of repeated cycling. Okay? But aluminum is heavy, even though it's a very light metal. What the 787 has done is they replaced aluminum, especially in the wings, with a composite made of carbon fiber and epoxy. You know what epoxy is? Have you guys ever used epoxy? What do you call it here? It's a very specific product. Nobody remembers. Say what? Quick fix, exactly. It also used to be called araldite in the old days. You got these two tubes and you mix them together. And then you put them on, and you would always get it on your finger, and it would stay on your finger for days and days. If you haven't tried it, try it again, right? Don't do that, please. <laughs> but it's the combination of carbon fiber and polymer. It's extremely light, but when you do that, you do not want to compromise properties. That's been sort of the holy grail in this whole community. How do you take polymers? Have them replace metals, okay? And the idea that people came up with, which is sort of embodied here, is you take a polymer, and into that you put something that's Nano. In the case of the 787, they're still afraid to put nanoparticles in. They're putting fibers, which are microns thick. Okay, and then they backfill with epoxy. The goal ultimately would be to go to nanoparticles. Okay? 
So I'm going to ask you guys a question. Everybody nodded and said, yeah, 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 you have, a, you have carbon fiber. And I said, it's micron thick. And then you fill it with epoxy. And then you use that to make a wing. OK? Why is it better to go from a micron size rope of carbon fiber to a carbon nanoparticle? Yes, it's buzzy, uh, you get money, all that stuff. But what's the reason nano is better than micro? Please, need time. So the problem is the following. So aluminum has, so I'm going to have to make a picture. Let's stress which is force per area. This is strain, which is delta L over L. I don't know how many of you have seen these plots. For a metal, I'm sorry, what? That doesn't mean they remember or they will confess to remember. So most brittle things will do that, like a ceramic will do that, right? So it's very strong, but when you drop your, cup, drop your coffee cup, even under low strain, it will break. So a metal generally is going to do this, although it may in some cases have some yield, and do that. A polymer, on the other hand, will look like this, which means the modulus, instead of being few gigapascal, is going to be in the megapascal. So at very low loading, it's going to be very flexible. So you'll be sitting on your plane, and the plane will be like deforming all over the place. Not good for business, because people get nervous. Okay? Also, if you, it'll buckle and do a really fortunate sorts of things. The thing it likes is that this area under the curve, which is how much energy you have to put into it before it will fail, is really, really big. So if you think about saran wrap, and how many of you have played with saran wrap? Good. One person has played with saran wrap. How many of you know what saran wrap is? Oh, come on. <laughs> call it the plastic wrap that you get? That some, what do you call it? Say what? So plastic bags. Okay. Take a plastic bag. Pull it. Will it stretch? Any problem stretching it? No problem, right? Take a piece of metal, try to stretch it. Can you stretch it? No. That's that early part of that curve. You need very little stress to pull a polymer. But then I challenge you to tear a plastic bag. It's going to take forever. You have to put energy like crazy. A metal will break. You just take this thing and you drop it from here, it's gone, right? And a ceramic cup, when you have coffee cups and stuff, you drop your coffee cup, it's going to break, and your mom's going to yell at you, right? So that's the, the advantage of all these structural materials like metals and ceramics is that they have high modulus, but low strain to failure. Polymers have very low moduli, but very large, what they call toughness, or the amount of energy you have to put into fail. So the hope is to increase the modulus by adding the particle without losing the toughness. So for the crystalline polymers, the crystal can be very strong. It, so Kevlar, for example, is starting to have moduli in the gigapascals, which is why you can use it for helmets and protect your head when you drive a motorcycle here. Right? And the amorphous part is what gives you the toughness. So one way, so that's the first idea of sort of a nanocomposite. So a polymer, if it's long enough, will not crystallize. You, you know all this stuff, right? I know what you're doing. <laughs> um, so the idea with the, with the polymer, if it gets long enough, it'll form crystals, but part of it will not crystallize. And so you get both the crystal and the amorphous part. Crystal is very strong. The polymer part, which is amorphous, is very flexible. You get both properties out. So now let me come back to my question. Why is going from a micron-sized particle? You have a soft polymer, like epoxy. Into that, you put these fibers to make composites to make the Boeing 787 wing. But the argument that has been made for the last 25 years, if you make the particles in nanometer size rather than micron size, it's even better. Why? Why? Uh, so you bought into all the uh, glitzy uh, advertisement, huh? Any other reason? She says that the nanometer size properties change. Yes, 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 just talk. Good. It's a very good answer. All the way at the back, you had an answer. What do you mean by that?
So I mean, you're sort of going along with her idea that the properties change, right? So there really are two answers, and both you guys are right. The real first answer is that as you make things smaller and smaller, the surface to volume ratio goes up, and so you can have better interaction between the particle and the polymer, and therefore get more intimate properties, okay? And you can control properties better. The other thing is that in, in ways that we don't understand, properties change as you go to the nanoscale, and maybe you can use that to make properties more amenable to what you want, okay? So these are very exciting things. The question is, why is it not ubiquitous? Why aren't people just throwing particles into polymers and making new products and running? Yes. It could be, um, so it could be that one, the area changes. Two, the way the polymer interacts with the particles mechanically could be different. So maybe the particle deformation could matter? Both. We don't know. This is a completely open area. The first thought was surface to area increases, but then people also know that properties change when you go to the nanoscale. They don't know how they change. Can you start to explore it? Yeah? You're not happy with my answer. Why do you say that? Oh, if you want to form defects, but nobody said you wanted to, right? And so it's totally unclear. It just, it's a whole new space to be working in. We don't know what happens, right? So why, I mean, I want to ask you guys a few more questions. What's the net polymer business today in the U.S.? Do you know what the polymer business is in, the U in India today? Do you know what the GDP is? Okay. I'll give you numbers I know for the U.S. GDP for the U.S. is $17 trillion. The polymer business is $500 billion, which is 3.5% GDP. Okay? Composites today in the U.S. is $1.8 billion. It's a huge number, but as a fraction of GDP, is nothing. And as a fraction of the polymer business, it's 4% of the polymer business. So yeah, there's a huge space to grow by adding particles to polymers. And obviously, you can start to get properties that are in between the two if I mix polymers and particles properly. Why aren't people doing it? Why is it only 4% of the polymer business, which is 3% of GDP? Question makes sense to everybody? You're not I'm communicating properly, right? Okay. Doesn't mean you have to have answers. So when you say polymer, what do you think about? What is it made out of? Say it, say it, say it, speak. Large what? No, it's trivial. Look, you, uh, out of the U.S. economy of 17 trillion, four, 500 billion is plastics. Okay? So that's 3% GDP. That means it's trivial to make them. So let's ask the following question. You can call up Nissan, the chemical company, right? And they will send you a bucket of 15 nanometer silica particles, 30% in methyl ethyl ketone. You just have to call them. You pay for shipping. But they'll ship you a ton anytime you want. We buy get barrels, 15 gallons at a time, and we use them all the time. So getting particles is trivial. And they use it for, if you think of the back of your sandpaper, that abrasive is silicon oxide. That's much bigger. You can see it, but making silicon oxide of whatever grade you want is trivial in a controlled manner. Making polymers is trivial. We know how to do that. We have two totally trivial things that we know how to make. If you mix them, there's a promise of great properties, but that's not happening. And his argument is maybe it's hard to mix them. You just have to get a ladle, like you do with a dosamal, and grind it up. No problem. You are confused about those from No. Yes. Yes. Mm. Mm. Correct. Correct. But we haven't even gotten to the point of making them, right? I mean, once you make them, then you start worrying about defects and stuff like that. That's a good point, I guess. <laughs> 
So his, his argument is defects. His argument is also defects. Let's keep that in line. That's the secondary point. Yes, all the way at the back. Once they are made, you can't do what? Like we use the other plastics now, right? It's called the great plastic patch in the Pacific Ocean. Most, Pacific, most plastic gets dumped in the ocean. So that's not a big deal. We don't care that much for the environment. That's all fake news. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's a good point, but that's not the problem, right? Because you can always find ways to recycle. If you know how to recycle polymers, you can recycle composite. Yes, ma'am. But then you use it for a shorter amount of time. If your problem is aging, right? I mean, we live in a culture where my phone lasts two years maximum. They set it up so at the end of two years it starts to fail because that's the only way Apple's going to make money. So we live in a disposable environment. So that's not a problem. If you make it cheap enough, people will replace, right? Again, we don't care for the environment, so it's fine. That's not the argument. So, when I say polymers, what are they made out of? Anybody know what polymers are made out of? Petroleum. Good. Is that water soluble? No. What does silicon oxide look like, the surface? Any oxide surface. Is it hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophilic, right? So it's like taking something water-soluble and something oil-soluble and trying to get them to mix. They don't want to mix. It's the canonical problem that has deviled the industry for the last 80 years. You know the one extraordinarily successful application of composites is rubber tires. You know how much of a rubber tire is rubber? You know what rubber is? It's polyisoprene. It comes out from those trees in Malaysia. We've all seen those pictures with these people standing up there and putting a hole in it, and this thing comes out, you catch it in the little thing, then you make a rubber tire, right? So think about, you know, an eraser that you use? That's also rubber, right? So what happens? You take an eraser, and you do that. You wipe something out. What happens to the eraser? It decays. It wears away, right? So imagine making a pure tire, a tire out of pure rubber. You'll be driving along, you leave a beautiful road in the back, but there'll be no tire, right? So how do you fix that? So people realized in the 40s that they had to put carbon black. So the stuff that comes off candles, that carbon black is what they put in to strengthen it. And that's how you have a tire that'll go for 100,000 miles, all right? But what fraction of a rubber tire is rubber? Any idea? What fraction is carbon black? Flip side to that question. No guesses? One what? 1% 1 carbon black? Try 50% carbon black. It's 50% carbon black, 50% rubber. So it's really not a rubber tire. It's a carbon black tire. That doesn't sound so cool, right? Rubber tire sounds bad. So it's, it, there's a huge marketplace. But this compatibility between polymer and particle is what's stopping you, OK? Oh, you know what they do? This is really exciting. You go talk to Michelin, which is the best company. They have these big mixers. They take the particles, throw it in with polymer, mix the crap out of it, and then rubber, you cross-link, right, by vulcanization. You fix the particles by vulcanization. So they hate each other, they're married to each other, and then they're done. Nobody understanding? So, how, so th these are the sort of things. If you go look in the U.S. today, and this is, of course, the most famous favorite car for Indians, the Toyota Corolla, right? Uh, all these things are made out of composites today. And the hope is that eventually 80% of the silly thing will be made out of composites. So we got into this problem like 15, 20 years ago. And this is a huge field of trying to get this state of compatibilizing, okay, particles and polymers. How would you do it? Particles and polymers hate each other. How would you make them compatible? One idea we talked about with Bobo is just cross-link them in, right? Connect them chemically to the network, the polymer, and then you're done, okay? But then going back to the point you made, it's very hard to recycle these things because once you have a chemical bond, it's hard to break them, okay? So what we did was something very, very simple. 
this idea you've seen before, right, of using surfactants. So we said, let's take these particles. Uh, this thing really hits the polymer behind you. Let me take some of the polymer chains, attach it to the particle, and then if I attach enough polymer chains to the particle, I can completely hide the particle surface. So it doesn't even know you have a particle, it's all polymer. Or even better, if I reduce the grafting density, certain part of the particle is exposed, so you have both a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic part, so it's like a surfactant. And so I can control its organization in a polymer matrix. And that's what we did about 10, 15 years ago now. This is controlling how many chains I attach per particle. This is the length of the chain I attach. So if I have long chains at high grafting density, the particles are completely shielded. I put it back in a polymer matrix, I get beautiful dispersion. This is what you want. This is the best mechanical state you want. But then if you want electrical percolation, for example, the particles are going to be conducting. If you reduce the grafting density, it becomes like a surfactant. You get these structures where the particles are touching each other and propagating across the whole system. It's percolated. And this gives you nice electrical conductivity at 2% by weight of the particle. So if you want to take a polymer and you want to make it conducting, the way to do that is to add this small number of particles that form these percolated structures. And we can control the structures that form purely because we understand surfactant self assembly Nobody follow? Yeah? And then there's all sorts of other things we do with it, but I wanted to sort of give you a pitch saying this idea of surfactancy can now start to find its way to commercial application. How am I doing for time? Half an hour or something like that? Yes, sir. Please, 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 yes. Every polymer, okay, now say that again. What were you saying? Say it slowly. The polymer is hydrophobic. So you buy polyethylene, which is just CH2, 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 CH2. It's a complete hydrocarbon. It's like paraffin wax. Okay? You take your candle, you put it in water. That's like trying to dissolve polyethylene in water. Will not go in. It's hydrophobic, it's insoluble. Okay? You take silica, which is like water, and you try and mix it with polyethylene, it doesn't want to mix. So what I'm going to do is take some polyethylene chains, graft them to the particle, and now the polyethylene sees polyethylene and says, ah, I can dissolve with you. The particle sees the other particle and says, ah, I like you, so let me assemble. So like a surfactant, the particle will assemble but be miscible with the matrix. Am I making sense? I can tell he's not. Yes. No, but see, look, this is a 15 nanometer particle, okay? That, those particles are 15 nanometers. Let me say I, add, I graft a polymer chain, which is 100,000 molecular weight, which is a very self-respecting polymer. That's called a radius of gyration of 10 nanometers. Because remember, the size goes as the square root of the chain length, right? So if the chain length is 10,000, and each bond is one angstrom, the mean squared end-to-end -end distance is going to be 100 angstroms. So it's comparable, it's going to be 10 nanometers, it's going to be comparable in size to the particle. So you start with a 15 nanometer particle, for the 10 nanometer polymer graph, it becomes a 25 nanometer particle, or a 35 nanometer particle, I don't care. It's still in the nanoscale. Yeah? Whoops. Who's making that noise? Is it me or? It might be my phone feed. It changes whatever, so if you want to make the elastic properties better, you make, so if it's in a liquid-like polymer, you put particles so that they percolate, and now you give a path for stress propagation, okay? And so you can make it mechanically 10 times stronger, while at the same time keeping the toughness. So that's how Michelin did it, they didn't know that, but we went back and told them they had a percolated particle switch. Yes, sir. You're asking a good question. I mean, hopefully, if I give you a particle with a grafted polymer architecture, right, then the morphology it forms is specified because it's like a well-defined surfactant, right? 
So when you mix the particle with the polymer, initially there's a transient that takes for the assembly to form. And right now it takes a matter of hours but these, because these particles are huge, right? What they would like it to be is milliseconds to seconds because that's how long they want to spend processing the polymer. Yeah? But once you form a structure... It's different, yeah, right? Exactly. I would start with... Right. And so these are, these are equilibrium structures. It's using equilibrium surfactants. Right. Again, I'm just going to throw this slide up to tell you that since I've told you it's a surfactant, we write a free energy exactly the way we did before. This R squared over NL squared is the distortion energy of the brush polymer. And then you start talking about how the brush interacts with the polymer matrix. Again, I'm not going to bother you with the details. This is now plotting the number of chains, the inverse of the chain length, and you start to predict the structures that form. In the other one, I was plotting the size of the chain. Here, I'm plotting the inverse size of the chain. So it's the opposite trend, but you go from dispersed to aggregated structure, and you create all these intermediate structures. That's what this extremely simple theory will predict. That's almost quantitatively in agreement with what we see experimentally. So it tells you that this very simple idea that we developed for surfactant self-assembly can be used to assemble dibloc copolymers. It can be used to assemble these composite structures where now you can control the particle dispersion from their properties. So we are very excited about this. And this hopefully will eventually come to the marketplace in some way. Right. Uh, the other, I wanted to give you one more application and then talk about polyelectrolytes, and then wrap up, okay? This is, for us, very exciting. So let me sort of tell you, again, I'm going to teach you a new field, but I think this, for you guys, the younger generation, is a really, really big deal. Now, everything notwithstanding being said about CO2, I mean, the current wisdom from my beloved president is that CO2 is not a pollutant, okay? That's horse crap. Eventually, you're going to have to get CO2 out of the air. There is no other way. You have to find a way to reduce the CO2 level from 250 ppm to below 100 ppm. And you have to do it cheap, because otherwise the cost will kill the universe. Okay? So how are you going to separate CO2 from oxygen or CO2 from nitrogen? So you burn methane. I mean, one idea is to go to green fuels, right? You go to solar cells and stuff like that, but it's unclear if the carbon cost of making the solar cell actually is able to be recovered by the usage. So if you go do a cradle-to-grave analysis, it's unclear if making a solar cell is the right way to go. So we're going to have to explore all kinds of technologies. The one idea I like is just to say you burn your methane, you make your methane from you know, biological feedstocks, uh, burn it, produces CO2, comes out with CO2 and nitrogen. I'm going to separate out CO2 from nitrogen and then do something useful with it. That would be the ideal way, recycle everything, right? How would you separate CO2 from nitrogen? Any ideas? Two gases, they're both gases, perfectly mixed, but I want to separate them. Somebody said something. Say what? Adsorption, who said that? That's a good idea, right? The problem is that you adsorb and then you have to put energy into desorb. And for everything we know today, the energy you put in in this process is more than you recover. So if you take the CO2, recycle it, that all the energy recovery you make is not enough to justify the adsorption process. The other option that people use to separate O2 from N2 is so-called the Lindy process. You take the air, cool it down below its critical temperature, it forms a liquid, you distill, you vaporize and you're off. That's a hugely expensive process because you have to refrigerate. Okay. The most popular process, I think, today, which is coming, is it turns out CO2 is slightly larger than oxygen. CO2 is four angstroms across. Oxygen is three angstroms across. So at home, what do you do when you want to clean up your flour? You get flour that you buy from whatever garment store. It's got bugs in it. What do you do with that thing? What do you see your mother do? Take a jali and you do that, right? So the idea is if I can make the right size of jali, then I can do the separation, okay? 
So that technology is what is now known as a glassy polymer membrane construct. You take a polymer liquid, you cool it down. When it forms a glass, it leaves holes. And Srikanth will tell you all about glasses. And it turns out those holes are just the right size to separate gases. OK? The problem is that if you want to separate another pair of gases, you have to go find a new polymer that makes the right size jelly. And that's kind of a pain in the neck. And there's lots of people doing this work. So we've been thinking about this problem. So it turns out if I take a mixture of two gases and I want one to go out, I want the flux to be really large and I want the purity to, of the, to be really large. So I want all the CO2 to go out and I want it to go out in high flux so that I can take all the atmospheric air and clean it up. Okay? So the flux here is related through fixed second law. D is the diffusion constant, C is concentration of the membrane, X is the membrane thickness. Right? If you assume some sort of Henry's law constant, this tells you the flux is the pressure drop across the membrane thickness of the membrane, and this quantity here, d times s, which is the permeability. And you want to make the permeability as high as possible. So that's the goal of all these studies, is how do you make a polymer membrane whose membrane flux or permeability can be increased. Okay? So also you want to make it selective, but that's a different story. So in this one, for it to separate oxygen from methane, the pore size has to be 3.7, 3.8 angstroms, with a really tight plus minus 0.1 angstrom. That's what you need to get it to go through. Okay. So people have been talking about this, right? It turns out these polymers that are used to make these membranes are not very good, and also you have to make a new polymer every time you want to separate new gases. So for the last 20, 30 years, people said, hey, let's throw particles in there, and magically that should do the trick. Now, no idea why they say that. But people have been saying it, and these ideas, occasionally there'll be a paper that comes along that says it works, and then people will show that that paper is wrong, and then they disappear. So this idea periodically gets brought up. Really no progress. What you want to do is somehow by adding particles, control the size of this jelly, control the problem. So what we've done is we've you know, understood that if I put particles into polymers, they have this miscibility problem, right? They hate each other. So we fix that totally by just grafting every chain to a particle. So here, there are no free chains. Every chain is grafted to a particle, but then I can control how big the particle is, I can control how many chains I graft to a particle, the length of the chain, lots of variables I can do. But here is something that is really, really interesting that we found. And I want to sort of tell you this because this goes back to the assembly concept and then I can quit. That's permeability. This is the graft molecular weight. And what you find is just by varying the graft molecular weight, I can vary the permeability by a factor of 10. No idea why, OK? And this sort of result now has become ubiquitous. People find if I take particles, I graft them with change, just by changing the length of the graft chain, I can change the permeability by a factor of 10. It also goes through a nice big maximum, OK? So I want to remind you what is happening, and I'm going to tell you the physics of this problem and throw it out to you guys, because this is an area where people are looking for guidance. And then I will go to my last application and get out. So here's my particle, it's grafted with chains. If the grafting density is very high, the chains cannot flop around because there's too many chains, they stretch out. They're really unhappy, right? But as the chains get bigger, somehow they become floppier. And somehow this thing controls everything that you see. Okay, we don't understand beyond that why, and I can sort of tell you what is going on. Computer simulations suggest the following happens. I take particles, uh, graft them with really short chains. The particles form a lattice. But the corona is no longer spherical. Particles are spherical. The corona takes this highly distorted shape. As I increase the grafting density, the corona shape completely distorts. So just by changing the grafting length of the corona, I go from a, a well-assembled structure to something that looks disordered. And apparently, when you go from this order to disorder, the permeability goes through a maximum. So there's a huge connection between transport properties and the structure of this corona layer, the assembled corona layer. We don't understand why. But this has immediate practical consequences. And that's why people are very excited about this. They want to understand the connections between the corona layer structure, the assembly structure, and the properties. of it. OK, enough of a pitch. Let me go to something that I find very interesting. I just sold you this fact that polymer chains don't like water. They're all hydrophobic. They totally, totally hate water. 
then I'm going to do a very simple reaction. I take a polymer called polystyrene. I'm going to draw the structure. It looks like this. But every second group, you add a benzene ring. OK? This polystyrene is what's called styrofoam. It's what your cups are, that you drink coffee out of. And you can put coffee in it, which means it doesn't like water at all. I put sulfuric acid into this. And I wait for a long time. OK? What that happens is, depending on how long I wait, I start doing this. OK? This guy becomes water soluble. You take polystyrene, totally insoluble. You add that one group, SO3 minus H plus, or SO3 minus Na plus, whatever, right? You just add this ionic group at the end. And suddenly, now, this polymer becomes water soluble. Hugely surprising. Any idea why? You're understanding the situation I'm describing, right? You take a chain, it's hydrophobic. I put a small number of charge groups along the chain. And suddenly now, this guy becomes totally water soluble. There is a reason I'm bringing this story. It sort of fits in with the theme of this workshop. Sort of like a protein, say more. You say you fold, is what you're saying. It's an excellent idea, but that's not what it does. So in the case of a protein, you have a precisely defined uh, sequence, right, that allows you to bury the hydrophobic groups and leave the hydrophilics on the outside. In this case, that's not what happens. What people believe happens is that the sodium groups there, right, they will, so think about, I want you to think about the energy of interaction between these two guys, right? So that's going to be Q1, Q2 over epsilon R, right? That's the energy of interaction. So now, if you're in a hydrocarbon medium, the electric constant is 2. The charges want to be totally coupled to each other because the electrostatic interaction is very strong. You put it in water, the electric constant goes from 2 to 80. The force holding those two charges goes down. These charges then become mobile. They leave the chain and start moving all over the solution. You gain lots of translation entropy for those counter ions. And that makes the chain go into solution. Not because the chain wants to go into solution, but because the counter ions really want to be in solution. So the counter ion entropy is what drives the solubilization of these polyelectrolytes. OK? It's a fact that has been known for like 40, 50 years. Again. Why do I care? Why is that important? Any clue? We'll talk about that, right? Let's, let's talk about why that's important. But I want to sort of think about what these chains do. So let's think about a very charred chain. This is the counter ion entropy, drives all the ions into solution. You have a, now a chain of charges. There's going to be very strong repulsion along the chain. The chain's going to st stretch out into a cylinder. OK? And now what people did was they started to calculate the electrostatic potential in this case. They started to calculate the free energy of this single chain with surrounding counter ions in water when the chain is a cylinder. Everybody understanding the logic of what we do? Yes, no, maybe? I've lost most of you, I think. Can we all come back? Are we all understanding what we're doing here? This is going to sort of feed biochemistry. That's where I'm going with this thing. But to explain that, I have to tell you what a single chain with charges does. It's a fully charged chain, OK? It's got counter ions. If the counter ions release and go away, you get entropy. And I'm going to ask you, do you think all the counter ions can be in solution, yes or no? So I have a chain that's very strongly charged, lots of groups that are charged. Each one of them has a counter ion. And I made the argument that the counter ions release and go into solution, you get entropy. They love that. So is that going to happen? Yes or no? Are all the contracts going to be in solution? Yes, you have an answer. Why do you think there should be shielding?
one logic. Any other logic? So think about what happens. So I argued that the counterline is going into solution is what drives the whole process, right? But in the process, you make a chain that's fully charged. The electrostatic repulsions between those charges is very, very strong. So you gain the translation entropy, but you lose this repulsion between the charges on the chain. The chain minimizes that by stretching out into a rod, but that's not enough. So what's the chain going to do? It'll say, I'll find some intermediate solution, right? Where some of the charges will go into solution, other ones will condense and stay on the chain. So rather than all the charges go out into solution, some number will go, but it'll, it will sort of put charges that are far enough apart so the repulsion is weak enough that it's a photo KT. All the other charges in between will be condensed, so the charges will stay. That makes sense to everybody? You following my logic? <laughs> I'm pointing at you with a great t-shirt. You following? You're trying to. Where did you, you get lost? Never mind. How about you behind? You following? Okay. So this polyelectrolyte chain, even though I'm sort of giving you this image that all the chains are completely charged, it's not really the case. You're going to have most of the charges condensed. There's going to be a few charges that the counterines go into solution. That entropy of those counterines is enough to dissolve the chain. But that also tells you there's lots of charges waiting to be released. They're just sitting there because if you release them, then the repulsion between these charges is too strong. Okay? So why do I care about that? It turns out, and I have so many remote controls, I don't know where I put mine. And there's a theory for that, which you don't care about too much. It's called Manning condensation. But here is something that I would like you to think about. I have two kinds of chains. One is called a polyanion, which is this guy. I have a negative charge along the chain. Okay, it's strongly charged, but many of the charges are condensed onto the chain. I put a polycation, which is the opposite. So I have a positive charge along the chain, negative counterion. Many charges are still condensed on the chain. I mix the two. What's going to happen? Let me explain the physical situation. I have this guy, and I'm going to put another chain which has a positive group along the chain, negative counterions. Many of them are also condensed. I bring those two polymers in contact with each other. What do you think happens? Sorry? How do we mean exchange ions? Correct. So what happens? Why would that be favored? So what she's saying, is she's saying, look, I lose this positive charge, I lose this negative charge, I'll bind these two guys, and so I still don't have negative or positive charges along the chain, because they have been neutralized, but I've released those two ions. Is that favorable or unfavorable? Yes or no? I didn't ask you that question. That's correct, but is that going to happen? So she's exactly right, because if you bring two charges, two chains, right, many of the ions are condensed, right? There's a few ions in solution, which is what let this chain go into solution. I bring an oppositely charged chain. What that will do is get rid of all the counter ions, have the chains pair up. Now all those ch charges that were trapped are now released. You gain massive amounts of entropy. But that complex now has no charge interaction. It has no reason to stay in solution. It drops out. And that process is called complex coacervation. Okay? Why is that important? It's important because apparently people now over the last five years have discovered that if you go look in cells, most things in cells have these surfactants covering everything. So the cell wall is a surfactant bilayer made out of Gemini surfactant. These things like stress granules are coacervates. And apparently, by not having a membrane around it, it's able to react faster to cues that the cell gives it. So if you look in a cell, there are entities that have a surfactant micelle covering it, okay? And those are the ones that it wants to protect more, but the ones it cares about less do not have a surfactant coverage. They are just these coacervates that form. And it turns out you can use these coacervates to not only put polymers together, but you can also put polymers with proteins. So you can have proteins that are designed to do certain function, be encapsulated, be floating around a cell, and then be available to do certain things which the cell wants you to do. 
So there's huge interest in this process of these structures that self-assemble, and apparently the stress, the, the cell does that all the time. The stress granules, these P bodies, these are all what are called membrane-less organelles that are formed. This guy, James Schroeder at UPenn, is one of the big leaders in this field. We don't fully understand why the cell does that. But apparently this idea of using self-assembly by using these charged complexes or coassivates is ubiquitous in nature. So there's two things you've learned in this sort of short which I tried to impress. One was you can take surfactants, right? And so by exposing the hydrophilic part to the outside, you make the cell be perfectly happy in blood. You also make the inside be completely hydrophilic, but in between you have this hydrophobic entity which prevents things from going in and out of the cell. So this idea of surfactant micelles or surfactant bilayers that form a very important to keeping the integrity of the cell. If you go look at the nucleus, it's also covered by a surfactant bilayer. So this idea of surfactant self-assembly is central to the way the cell operates. But more and more, there are also these non-surfactant coated organelles that form, and apparently they are also extraordinarily important. So assembly in various forms, driven either by charge or by surfactancy, seems to be driving a lot of processes in the cell. And so I want you to start thinking about those concepts. Please go forward. I'm done. Thank you.